half-long discussion. DNA Day in Canada was created five years ago to connect all Canadians with the science community to explore genetics and genomics. It's really important to remember why we take a day and call it DNA Day. DNA makes up the genes, genes are in your cells, they tell your cells what to do, and cells make tissues, tissues make organs, organs make you. So this is true for all living things, so on DNA Day we're kind of celebrating what makes us all, but also what makes us all unique and different. And why April? Got to go back a long way, probably before most of you watching this were born, and maybe even before your parents were born. April 1953, two scientists, James Watson and Francis Crick in England, published a scientific paper describing the double helix, how DNA was put together. In April, again April of 2003, the Human Genome Project was completed, so we had an idea of the complete set of human genes, so DNA Day is appropriately in April. Let's talk science, and Genome Alberta are the two organizations behind the scenes that make DNA Day possible. Let me just tell you a little bit about them. Let's talk science is a national education and outreach organization that engages young Canadians in what's called STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And they do that by creating programs that make all of these subjects relevant, interesting, and trying to give kids, all of you, an incentive for studying them in the future. Genome Alberta is a not-for-profit corporation that initiates funds and manages genome research and partnerships in Alberta. And I want to say a special thank you to a number of organizations that have helped make this possible today. Genome Canada, Genome Atlantic, Genome BC, Cybera, the Ontario Genomics Institute, and Genome Prairie. We've got genomic scientists right across this country. So as I said earlier, we have about an hour and a half to discuss your genetics questions. We're going to get to as many of them as possible, but if we don't get to your specific question, you still have an opportunity to get an answer by joining one of the text-based chats that are happening already today. And if you'd like to submit a question for today's chat, just email your question to the email listed below on the video. We have two genomics experts with us today to handle your questions, and I'm going to have, they are uh, Francois Bernier and Carolyn Fitzsimmons in Edmonton, but I'm going to have them introduce themselves. So Carolyn, why don't you tell us who you are? Okay, Th uh, thanks Jay. Um, I'm a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So I, I, my home base is in Lacombe, but I'm actually at the University, University of Alberta in Edmonton. And my research focuses on genetics and genomics in livestock. So what I basically do is, is help, eventually help farmers and producers select better livestock to uh, uh, improve their interactions with the environment, but also produce healthier livestock, and also um, better animal protein in the end. I also work on uh, the interaction between maternal nutrition and uh, effects on the offspring. So what, what the maternal diet is and how it affects the expression of genetics in calves and, and chickens, offspring of the livestock we use. And I, think, I guess it goes without saying that livestock is a hugely important uh, activity in Canada. So thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Francois. Hi. Um, welcome to DNA Day. It's great to be here. I'm a physician. Um, after finishing medical school, I entered directly into a training program that's relatively new, and I did it um, to be a clinical geneticist. So all of my clinical practice deals with human genetic diseases, how we diagnose them, how we tell families about it, how we uh, about those disorders, and, and how do we treat them. And um, I'm also an associate professor at the university, and so I have an academic interest um, mainly in how we use genomic technologies both in healthcare, so how we're going to introduce this stuff to, to hopefully make us all healthier, um, but also how do we use the technology to improve our knowledge of what causes human diseases, uh, particularly rare disorders. We'll talk a little bit about them today. 
and then, uh, like Carolyn, also have an interest in um, maternal health and its impact on, on kids and birth defects, and uh, that interest spans across the globe, as I also work in Tanzania on, on maternal health projects. So we have an amazing list of questions. Keep them coming, and I think we should just dive in and start the fun. Let's do that. So <clears throat> we have a question from Eshta, a grade 12 student. Can we use genetics to predict the behavior of an individual? Uh, sounds like a, a human question, although, of course, Carolyn, uh, there may actually be some relevance for livestock as well, but let's kick this off to Francois. Well, let's get right into it, right? Yeah. Why not? Um, so, difficult question. I, I think that um, in the past there was this whole and uh, nurture versus nature debate. So, you know, are we the product of our environment, what our parents taught us, what we learned in school, um, our good and bad life experiences, or are we purely programmed? Are we uh, nature? Um, and I think most of us now would feel in the feel that that it's it's not a useful debate. That we are truly a combination of genetic tendencies, and sometimes those genetic tendencies are really strong. And we'll talk about some of those genetic disorders where a genetic change has a huge influence on our health or on on uh, intelligence, for example. Um, but I think personality is really a complex thing. I think there are tendencies that clearly come from our genes. We would know that for something like attention deficit, which would have an impact on our personality. It might make us less attentive or more Good. outgoing or all these things. <clears throat> that ADHD does have a genetic component. We can find some of those genetic markers and we can identify them, um, but they're not never perfect. In isolation, it's rare that these would have a huge influence or a unique influence on our personality. Um, if you just look at families and, and siblings, we see trends where, yep, lots of similarities in personality, and then you'll get non-similarities. You'll get identical twins that, yes, have very, very similar personalities. You'll get identical twins, of course, who have the exact same genetic information. You'll get identical twins who don't. But on balance, identical twins would share more personality traits than they would typically if they were only brothers and sisters. So that would tell us that there probably is a genetic influence on personality. Um, do we know all those genes? Absolutely not. Do we have a test for personality? Absolutely not. So would you say then really if you if if you think it's black and white, you're mistaken. Correct. It, it, I hesitate to use the phrase shades of gray, but uh, you know it's uh, it's that it, do you find that in uh, your studies as well, Carolyn? Uh I think, like, I, I really have to echo what uh, Francois said, that it is really, truly a, a mixture of, of genetics and environment. And I think we have to remember that, you know, people people experience, have different experiences over their lifetime that continually shape their personality. So, and that also actually may shape the way their genetics are. So there, you can't really predict how a person is going to behave if they're constantly exposed to to different um, sedations, uh, um, behavior stimulus. So so it's really, it's, it's very hard re to truly predict. Um, there may be some tendencies, but yeah, it, it's, you can't uh, say 100% what someone is going to do in a situation based on their genetics or even on their past uh, exposure um, to environment. Right, and I mean something that happens to you when you're very young, depending on your genetics, can influence your behavior as an adult or not. Uh, yeah. so it's pretty complicated. So it's a great question to kick off though. Uh, here's another one. Natarsha, a grade 12 student, asks, is it possible to have a blood transfusion with a monkey? Setting aside the question of whether you want, but maybe you fi you'd find yourself in an emergency situation. So. Yeah, so uh, that question's been around for a while, and and you know, uh, getting enough blood to to support all the transfusions we need is difficult, and people have asked the question, well, why don't we just use monkey blood? Um, uh, not going to work. Um, and it, you know, we all know we have ABO blood types in humans, and we have an RH factor, and in fact, we probably have about 260 different proteins that sit on our blood cells that our body has to be able to say I recognize you as self and right. I'm going to tolerate you as being in my body and we do that to ourselves we have to recognize our own blood cells so uh, you know in the 1800s when people started transfusing human blood it worked sometimes and some patients died 
and it's a really masterful scientist to recognize that if you start mixing blood from two humans, sometimes like if you and I have a different blood type, not going to work. Yeah. Right. So the sense is that the the monkey blood or or any non-human species blood would always be too different. That our body would look at that and say, "No, I'm going to attack you," and and so would not tolerate the transfusion. Um, and it and actually would be quite serious. People would die from incompatible blood transfusions, and it, it would be a, a very risky thing to do. So, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get our blood from monkeys. No, nope, I have to encourage more humans to do that. But you know, there there's a bit of a theme here because we have another question about uh, our primate relatives uh -huh. and us. So. I'm going to uh, this comes from Safa, a grade 12 student, who wants to know, can a chimpanzee and a human ever have a baby? Chimps have 48 chromosomes, humans have 46, but horses and donkeys have a two chromosome difference and they can still reproduce and have a mule. Okay, I'd throw that over. <laughs> there's a little yeah. bit of livestock in there, you know, with the mule yeah. and there's a little bit of human, so I'd just throw this open to either one of you. I can I can start I guess. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, physically, um, uh, humans and chimpanzees aren't really attracted to each other, so so uh, they they probably won't be able or be willing to to get together and have a baby. And also physiologically, it might not work. You could possibly try um, if in a laboratory setting to combine um, either uh, chimpanzee sperm or egg with human sperm or egg and uh, to, to get at the answer of if the chromosomes would would actually form together and, and eventually produce a zygote. Um, to, to try that, uh, it would really, if that was to, to see if it would, would be successful, would really de be determined by what's on those uh, different chromosomes between humans and chimpanzees. Still, even if a zygote or, or um, was, was formed, you're not guaranteed that it would ever survive to a term pregnancy. But, it, but uh, uh, it might be possible in a laboratory setting, but it really depends what's on those chromosomes that are are different between human and chimpanzees. You guys can expand on that if you like. <laughs> well, I'm gonna. I have a couple of questions, but I'll let Francois tackle this first one. Yeah, I think there's. It's a fascinating question because um, it, it, we can do a little bit of thinking about our own human chromosomes. Um, so we actually create unbalanced chromosome sets all the time at conception. About 30% of human conceptions either have an extra chromosome or a missing chromosome. Wow. And I yeah, didn't know so that. the large amount of, and some people say as high as 50% of human conceptions. And mm -hmm. the vast majority of those are lost as very, very early miscarriages hmm. because trisomy 1 or trisomy 8, remembering your chromosomes go from number 1 being the biggest to number 21 pair being the smallest. All of those are lost as miscarriages. We've never seen a human with You mean when you have one extra? Yeah, so if you have three chromosome 1s instead yep. of two, never going to see a human with that. Two incompatible. So we see Down syndrome, three chromosome 21s, because it's a relatively small chromosome, not the smallest. Right. It's a relatively small chromosome and for some reason our human biology tolerates it. So it, from my take when you put put a horse and a donkey together they're pretty close. The mule actually has the middle number of chromosomes between the horse and the monkey, uh, the horse and the, and the donkey. And the donkey. Um, but they're infertile because they can't tolerate having that extra chromosome when they come to create. See I, it amazes me that they can even tolerate having, a, a, like a chromosome has what hundreds of thousands, thousands. thousands yeah. of genes yeah. and you'd think they'd be producing whatever they normally yeah. produce and how they could accommodate that is beyond but, me. But Down syndrome does. Yeah. Humans no, can tolerate true. a whole extra, but it takes a very special combination and the rest of the chromosomes have to be perfectly matched. 
So I think the human and chimpanzee chromosomes would not be anywhere near a match and would be way too incompatible. So my sense is that you would not get a conception out of that even in a lab. It would just not uh, reach even maybe early cell division. Those chromosomes are not going to know what to do with each other. Right. They won't know how to dance during mitosis, right, cell division. Right. Because um, so the impression we get in that. school is that mitosis is a very orderly... It is. ...carried out. Everything gets together, it splits perfectly, but the, the lesson in this question and I think yeah. is that that's not always the case. But I want so I want to ask one more very quick one. If chimps have 48 chromosomes and we have 46, does that mean they have more genes than we do? Yeah, I don't know, Carolyn, if you looked up the number of genes. So it, my sense is that the number of genes is actually a little bit lower than the number of genes we have. Oh, yeah. um, just divided it, up differently. Divide up differently, right? So. Uh, I think horses, just because I had to look this up, have 62 chromosomes or 64 chromosomes and certainly don't have, you know, 30% uh, more genes than we do because we have 48, right, everyone? So, um, 46. 46, yeah. Thanks for the correction. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so um, uh, grade 11 biology class at Perry Sound High School in uh, north of Toronto on Georgian Bay uh, has this question. Do the polar bodies accidentally get released? This is a pretty high level uh, reproductive biology question and I'm glad I don't yeah. have to answer that. Do the polar bodies accidentally get released? Would this result in a pregnancy ever? Can they be fertilized? And would it have enough nutrients to be implanted? So we've got polar bodies, do they get released? Would you get a pregnancy? Would it, that pregnancy get far enough that they, for whatever the fertilize, if it were a fertilized body, would it get implanted in the wall? of the uh, uterus. Well, anybody? Happy uh, yeah, I actually, I, I had to go look this one up too because it sounds, it, to me, I think the, the student might know the answer to this question already. Um, if the polar bodies are accidentally released and uh, somehow fertilizes, it's true, they don't have as much cytoplasm as the the major oocyte, so it's pretty unlikely that they would be able to produce an embryo. How about you, Francois? Yeah, I think. Um, uh, and just before you start, about what a are they precur? Is. Yeah. Thank so, you. yeah, maybe we should define what they are. Yeah. So when it, men and women make uh, eggs and sperm in different ways, so. For men, we have a single cell, and it's going to undergo two rounds of meiosis, right? Meiosis one is going to divide that cell. We've doubled up the genetic information, and we have two cells. They're of equal size. Each one of those cells is going to go meiosis two, splitting off their chromosomes, and now we have a haploid, one set of chromosomes, 23, got the number right this time, <laughs> in four equally sized sperm, and they are all got their tail, and they're ready to go. Okay, so females have a single starting cell. Meiosis one is going to create one primary cell and a very very small one. And that primary cell is a primary oocyte. The other one we call a polar body. <laughs> now it's got an abnormal amount of jank information. So if you fertilize that one, not going to work, right? Because it's got double the jank information in it. The next round of meiosis is going to take that primary oocyte. It's going to divide it again, and you're going to create one egg correct number of chromosomes, 23 to be fertilized by a sperm with 23, 46, we got a baby, right? But we have three polar bodies, right? right. Each one of those has in theory been talked about um, in the literature as the possibility of creating a half twin. Same mom, right? In right. both polar bodies, yep. the twin is same mom and same dad. A half twin would be same mom but you have to fertilize that second polar body with a different sperm. So there is this language of a half twin. Never been recorded in humans. No one's ever identified one. And the theory is that, it, you know, I think this student is probably leading us into the right answer. That those polar bodies, although they're a true cell, they have all the stuff a cell needs. They have mitochondria. They have a reticulum and endoplasmic reticulum to create proteins. They have the DNA information, but it's got very little cytoplasm and the cytoplasm is crucial for early development of the um, cycle. 
So they would typically, you know, for lack of a uh, more technical term, run out of food and probably just never make it through early divisions. There is lots of interesting biology here because there are some other species that, in fact, do rely on the polar body to support the development of an early embryo and potentially some other species that theoretically are using the polar body to actually create a conception, um, but not in humans. So never been recorded. Okay. Um, Someone knows of one, let us know. We want to publish it. <laughs> I'd like to, can I just throw out a quick question about twins? I have read that, that at early fertilization, there are actually many more sets of twins than eventually result. In fact, there is a, an urban myth that Elvis had a twin. Or an, now, I, I hit that twin might have uh, developed a little bit further, but is that true that... Uh, Maybe even a majority of pregnancies actually start out as twins. Yeah, I think ultrasound, and you know, I do a lot of uh, prenatal genetics. So I work in a high-risk ultrasound unit. And we do a lot of early scanning, and the fertility clinics certainly do. And um, by early scanning, you do identify more frequently two conceptions. Um, that ultimately, in the long run, will be a single pregnancy. Hmm. Um, majority, probably not, but maybe ten or twenty percent could be hmm. a rough guess. Could be twin conceptions if you look early enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we have a follow-up question from the Perry Sound uh, High School, and it is this. Do women who receive fertility treatments experience menopause sooner than those who don't as a result of the eggs, uh, in which there's a predetermined number of them, getting used up? So fertility treatment, do you get enter menopause when your, legs, your eggs have run out earlier? Happy to. Uh, you might as well for that one. So, um, what happens? With menopause is is a stage of life for women where, um, it, when you reach a small number of eggs, still about a thousand eggs left, um, the, the reproductive system is going to start shutting down, and you will stop having regular periods and re releasing an egg on a monthly cycle. Um, the fascinating biology here is that uh, women actually start their life with about three million eggs. Um, so if you look at prior to birth, during development, which is actually when the eggs are formed, stage one meiosis occurs when mom is still a fetus, and then the eggs are held in that suspension. So those primary oocytes are all there um, hmm. during development. So there's about three million. Wow. A large number of them die off before birth. So at birth, women have about 300,000 eggs. So they have a 300,000 reserve down to about 1,000. So this isn't that tight of a system, um, and we're losing eggs all the time. What happens with ovulation is there's a pulse of hormone. FSH is going to tell time to start maturing a oocyte, but it's not one. It actually matures a whole bunch of them. And so uh, only one is going to make it. So you might start maturing 10 or 12 or 15 every month. Only one is going to make it; the other 15 die off, anyways. So well, there's loss at there's every a stage. Loss right? at every stage, and there's a progressive loss over a lifetime. So IVF treatment is now stimulating mom using hormones. Very hard to mature a large number of eggs, but what they're probably doing is taking those 15 instead of having 15, one make it, 14 die. You're probably having eight or nine of them survive, and you harvest them out. So you're probably not stimulating more than is happening hmm. naturally. You're just going to harvest out the normal ones. So the overall sense, you know, bottom line is no IVF. It typically would not decrease um, a, a woman's reproductive life by pushing her into early menopause because we're stimulating too many eggs to come out. Is um, it too early actually to know that for sure? I mean, have we been doing in, uh, you know, for mm -hmm. IVF has been around for. 20, 30 years. So know. most of those women are not at menopause yet. Uh, or no, many. most would be. You know, twenty. They, you know, what, IVF depending is 35, when they were. 40 year olds. Oh, right? I, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, there we would know. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of a change of pace here. Um, a DNA, a specific DNA question, and that is if this is from uh, Randy at Lester B Pearson College, collegiate. Sorry, collegiate, not college. If all our DNA were uncoiled, how much space would it take up? All yours, Carolyn. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm not. A, I'm not a sure about space, but if if you did um, uncoil the 
being one typical from one cell, it would be about two meters long. Yeah. So we have quite a few uh, uh, hundreds of millions of cells in our body. So if you if you were to uncoil the DNA from all the cells in our body, it's predicted to span about. I think about two lengths of our solar system or something. So it, it'll you're walking around with quite a lot of DNA inside you. So it's a it's a heavy load. Well, and and the amazing thing is, really, I guess, how how do you pack, you know, six feet or two meters worth of DNA into a cell that you can only see in a microscope? I mean, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Okay. So the and, yeah, and as Carolyn a... said, it's sort of hard to know what actual like three-dimensional volume that would be but in terms of uh, length that would be pretty amazing. Uh, Fran uh, Francois, we do have a question um, in French. Do you have that uh, question handy? And seeing as how you are the key bilingual person uh, on the panel, if you don't have it on paper, I, I have it. Okay, yeah. good. Alors, uh, on a une question soumise par Dre de l'école secondaire Saint Francis. Et c'est au sujet du, du de métabolisme génétique. Euh, alors, Dre nous demande comment fonctionne le métabolisme sous forme génétique. Alors, euh, j'interprète un peu euh, l'intention de la question de Dre, c'est un peu de parler de l'influence de, de nos gènes sur notre métabolisme. Alors, notre métabolisme, c'est un système complexe sans doute, C'est le but c'est de maintenir une, une physiologie uniforme, on est obligé de produire de l'énergie, on est obligé de détoxifier le corps, euh, etc., etc. La majorité du système métabolique euh, euh, est soutenu par des enzymes, euh, ces enzymes-là sont certainement sous contrôle euh, génétique, sont le produit direct d'un gène. Alors, on a des maladies rares euh, où il nous manque des enzymes. Alors, ça, ce serait des, des maladies métaboliques, mais ils sont quand même rares. Alors, ça, c'est des maladies euh, d'acide aminé ou d'acide orga organique, euh, souvent qui vont créer des, des maladies assez sérieuses chez les enfants. Alors, chaque hôpital d'enfants dans le pays a un système, un, un service de génétique métabolique qui vont euh, euh, essayer de sou soutenir euh, ces enfants-là. Peut-être la question était dirigée vers peut-être le métabolisme plus général. Alors, si on parle de l'obésité, par exemple, euh, est-ce que c'est sous l'influence des gènes? Alors là, ça serait un système très complexe. Ce serait euh, devenir euh, ensemble une tendance génétique, puis il y en a certainement une tendance génétique vers les systèmes métaboliques euh, et aussi l'environnement. Alors, euh, oui, sans doute, je pense que le, notre système métabolique est sous le contrôle euh, génétique, euh, mais ça dépend, euh, comme toute chose, comme souvent, génétique humaine, euh, l'influence peut être très sévère de, des maladies sérieuses ou une influence euh, interactive avec euh, l'environnement. So, the question was uh, around metabolism and genetics, and uh, I think you know, our metabolism, which is our system of hormones, our systems of enzymes that maintains homeostasis, our ability to have enough energy and to detoxify our, our bodies, uh, is that under genetic control? And sure, I mean, our body is built by genes, our enzymes are built by uh, proteins that are coded by genes. And the question then is how much does it influence those systems? And at the extreme end, yes, if you're missing an enzyme because you have a genetic defect, uh, you will have a genetic metabolic disorder, if you don't keep nuri or some of these rare metabolic disorders. But I, my impression was that, you know, this was maybe geared towards common metabolism type questions, you know, obesity or heart disease. And sure, there's a genetic environment interaction there. So thanks. Uh, merci uh, pour la question. Uh, Dre, j'espère que j'ai uh, pu la répondre. So um, just to, we want to loop back just for one sec to an earlier question because we have some additional information and it's pretty cool and this was contributed by Jeff Dunn who's at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Calgary and it's about that question, could we get a blood transfusion from a monkey and Jeff points out that um, the hemoglobin in the red blood cells, which is really why you want that blood transfusion because it takes up oxygen for you, uh, the hemoglobin doesn't stimulate any rejection in and of just no. by itself. And so he, Jeff Dunn points out that some companies, so in other words, you wouldn't reject hemoglobin from a monkey as long as it isn't 
encased in that monkey's red blood cells. And apparently some companies have tried marketing just naked hemoglobin as an emergency response, which fascinating. I, fascinating, and I, I find it hard to believe that would work, but you know what? You've got to try it. For like many of our proteins, you know, we can do these alignments, right? We can decide how close is a bovine hemoglobin to a human hemoglobin, and so you can look at across species. And hemoglobin is actually very, very well conserved. It has been so successful as a molecule that virtually everything that needs hemoglobin uses the same version of it or a very similar one. So that was great input. Appreciate the feedback. We've got, uh, you know, GMOs, uh, genetically modified organisms, are a big topic uh, uh, these days, and um, there's both opposition to them, and there's both science addressing their safety. Uh, and Carolyn, uh, you being in the business of livestock genetics, certainly have, uh, you've come across, you know, you're, you know what GMOs might, might mean for the livestock industry. Could you give everybody watching a sense of what, in terms of livestock, a genetically modified organism might be? Um, in in typical livestock production, we we really haven't made it that far to to have any commercial production of GMOs. There there have been some genetically modified uh, pigs and cattle that have do exist in in the research community. In general, they are they are very expensive to produce. And the efficacy of producing them, like the ability to to produce a, a GMO animal, is is not very well developed and and uh, and works well yet. So typically, those animals that have been produced that that have been produced as a GMO, they have a very specialized purpose. So something that might benefit human medicine, for example. Maybe, uh, like, I think there are pigs developed that don't have certain antigens um, uh, in their blood so that maybe, possibly, they would be used in the future for uh, 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 organ transplant or, or something like that. Right. But in, in general, for, for typical livestock production, they're just too expensive and too valuable animals to to allow people to or to allow people to eat them basically they're they're generally used for research purpose in the future if the technology does evolve and it has to evolve a lot um, before it's viable it, it we could maybe produce uh, animals um, GMOs that that might be used for food production but that's a long ways away, and we have a lot more research to do before that will happen in livestock. So, Carolyn, could I just change the focus of the question a little bit and ask you about genomics, the, the you know, huge amount of information we now have about the genes of many, many animals, uh, including cattle. How is, so without actually, you know, inserting genes into cows or anything like that, how has the better knowledge of the of the cattle genome, how is that influencing the production of livestock? Well, with all the sequencing that's been done recently, like the, I think the first cow was fully sequenced in 2009. Um, since then, now uh, thousands of, of cattle have been sequenced and we're starting to know a lot more about the landscape of uh, the genome. And now we're, we're starting to look at or figure out what genes control some of the complex traits that we're, inter we're interested in. There, there are some traits that, like um, uh, uh, hair color, that are controlled by a small subset of genes. And we, we, we start to figure that out. But most of the traits that we're interested in livestock production, for example, how fast an uh, animal grows, um, how uh, is there differences in health potential, those are controlled by many, many, many genes. Um, 
now that we have the genome sequence, we can look at uh, this, the, the polymorphins, polymorphisms within DNA, so different changes in DNA, and start to link them to traits that we're interested in. But still, there's a lot of interactions between genes that we don't understand um, that we really have to work out. We are getting a bit better at predicting what an animal's genetic potential could be, for example, growth. Um, we, we could, using the whole genome, we can predict, some of our predictions can can get up to, you know, 50% of the variation. But there's still a lot of other variation that we don't know. And also when we're, we're using genetics to predict animals, we have to, we can only predict animals that are related to the ones we've studied because there are a lot of other interactions within the DNA going on that, that we can't predict if the animals aren't related to the animals we've already um, studied to figure out these predictions. Yeah, well, it's good to have a little bit of caution. I'm reminded of the story that when the, uh, when the American bison were down to about 200 animals at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, people tried to breed them with cows. Um, on the you know sensible idea that you'd get an animal with the calm disposition of a cow but the quality meat of a bison and from what I understand they got mostly the reverse a really mean bad tasting animal um, and what is interesting is that you look now in North America there's like 700,000 bison across North America there are only two herds that are cow gene free one outside Edmonton at Elk Island one in Yellowstone National Park Anyway, okay, let's get back to humans, and there, there's a great question here that I think we could have a lot of fun with. This is from Charbury, a t grade 10 student. Do you believe that the fundamentals of becoming a teacher or a chiropractor or a billionaire are because of the composition of our DNA? Do we have a choice among those three? <laughs> I think a billionaire might depend on how much money your parents have. <laughs> Yeah, which is sort of inheritance, but not the kind we're talking about. Well, let's uh, let's tackle that though. It's it's really that question of what DNA makes you or doesn't make you. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we touched upon it a little bit earlier. Um, if I had a, the gene test to decide who is going to be a billionaire, I I would be a billionaire myself. Um, so I don't have that test. Um, so. It, it's a, it's a great question because it, it gets at conceptually, I think, what motivates a lot of our inquiry this er in this area and, and maybe just natural human inquisitiveness around who we are and why are we the way yeah, we are, exactly. right? I mean, it's, it's, it's just fundamental. Why do I look like my parents? Or, it's the first thing we say when we see a baby, you know, looks like mom, looks like dad. Yeah. And, oh, you know, it's going to be just like grandpa. And, you know, so humans are, are naturally curious about this question. Why do some people achieve some things? Are we better suited to a particular um, career based on our genes because we have a particular personality type? And, I mean, my goodness, uh, it's such a complex uh, outcome influenced by so many things who our mentors were what opportunities we had in life whether we got to school or not to school is there some intrinsic qualities that are tendencies in a very large group that you might be able to determine and we do a lot of large group genetics you know thousands and thousands of people are sequenced or have had genome-wide association SNP variant tests to see if we can get personality traits um, and you find trends, they tend to locate to areas of, of the genome that it's hard to know if there's a specific gene or not that would influence uh, personality behavior. There's great studies on risk-taking behavior, you know, are the people who like to jump out of planes different than the people who don't like to jump out of planes? And we all know they probably are, we can tell when you first meet them. Um, but is that genetically encoded? And, and yeah, there's some evidence that there are trends there and uh, but do we know those genes? Do we know those pathways? So I think that the bottom line is we don't know. I think our intuition would tell us that it's not going to be that simple. Um, and and 
Personally, I have to admit that I hope it's not entirely in our genes, and I'm sure it's not. That life experience, early life learning, we know is important. Maternal nutrition, whether you're a cow or a human, is no doubt is important to, to grow on good brains. Um, so this is a complex system, but it is fun to speculate. Um, yeah, no, exactly. So the, are. there's another question that, that is, a little, is like that, but a little bit more specific and may have a different kind of answer. This is from uh, Ibrahim, a grade 12 student who wants to know to what extent do genetics affect one's athletic growth potential? Yeah, so... Um, so it's a little bit more concrete than you know, are you going to become a billionaire? Yeah, so I think there's two components to that. It, there are, for sports, and we all know this, right, there are traits that make you a better athlete in certain sports. And yeah. some sports are very, uh, are more amenable to that trend, um, basketball, volleyball. You know, I'm sorry if you're five foot one, that's... <laughs> that's um, right. And if Unless you can jump really high. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're right. No kidding, you have right? some chance. You know, if you're seven foot one, it's uh, gymnastics is a tough sport, right? Um, so those physical traits do influence to a certain extent your ability to be a high level athlete. And then there are more subtle things, you know, our VO2 max, our ability to extract oxygen, um, our ability of our heart to respond. Fast to twitch training, muscle fibers. Fast twitch muscle fibers, low twitch muscle fibers. There are companies marketing a test. You can look it up online. You can send a cheek swab and a spit and say, you know, what is my athletic potential? I think those are really weak associations. Um, the tendency is, yes, you will see in a large group that this particular muscle fiber will give you a particular advantage. Um, but the link between the genetic test and predicting that is actually very weak. Um, so it's more of a marketing ploy right now, I would say. And overall, I would say drive, training, opportunity, all those human characteristics that we know to be an athlete you have to have, that compete attitude um, and an interest. Um, so more a perfect, concrete, perfect but, example in uh, in hockey where you have not a large number, but but a you know, but always there are players who are five foot seven, 160 pounds, yeah. who are fantastic hockey players. You never would have predicted that yeah. from any kind of survey. Can I jump off from this question? I'd like both of you, if you would, to comment on this. And this is not a question from a student, but you mentioned marketing ploy, uh, and of course. It's now you can you can get it you can have your own DNA tested, and when you get the results back, you can be told you have certain risks or you have certain characteristics that you're likely to exhibit. Are those um, I don't want to use the word legit, but are those something where the information is pretty solid? So um, I think it varies. I, the best the best summary I heard of these tests and you know not to name any of the companies yeah. directly, but um, is uh, there are things that are fun to know in the results. There are things that um, uh, you might want to know uh, in the results, and there are things you might not want to know in the results. And uh, the things that are fun to know sometimes in these tests is, you know, we may come to the question of race and ancestry at some point, but, you know, yep. we can get a genetic ancestry out of these things. So if you want to know you know, did my family ever have an origin out of Italy in some Italian type southern Mediterranean genes, then yeah, that test will tell you those things. If you want to know your hair color, well, look in the mirror, but the test will tell you as well. If you want to know if you have um, a tendency to earwax, well, try and figure that one out some other way. But, you, you know, it will tell you some things about yourself, and those can be fun to know, and, and there's a whole social genetics component of these things with yeah. people finding family members who have come from a similar area. The things you might want to know could be disease risk, and there is some of that information in there. It's maybe not as good as companies would promote it to be. I think what scares some of us in the field is that some of the tests suddenly start including some very high-powered genes, right? Do you want to know if you're going to have a breast cancer gene? Yep. And you're a teenager, you know, or a young adult, and, you know, that carries a 60% risk of, of uh, breast cancer at a young age and you know you're not insured yet you don't know your employability or you so there are things that get mixed into this and this is a very complex um, it's a very complex test right, right. so right. to understand the fun of it and and the power behind it and mitigate the power and I think that's our challenge for society uh, like all powerful technologies um, how do we extract the benefit and protect from the harm um, and uh, how do we do so in a framework that doesn't stifle uh, 
innovation. I don't think that's the goal, but does it in a way that protects people? Right. Complex question. Is yeah, there yeah. direct marketing of testing to, to cattle farmers? I, I'm curious. Are, are they uh, being pressured to actually, test I, their bulls? And yeah, some of the... There are certain breeds that are ahead of other breeds. For example, the Angus breed, both in um, Canada and the U.S. They do uh, genotype Fighting on a, a 50,000 uh, SNP chip, and they will give you predictions of uh, different carcass traits. So things like um, uh, uh, amount of meat produced by an animal, but also how tender that meat can possibly be. Um, also things like uh, mature weight in cattle and, and even feed efficiency in animals. So s some of those um, accuracies for the Angus breed, they're starting to get, you know, up around 50%. If, if you meet those animals with, with other animals that you also know the genetics behind. So, so there are some traits that yes, they're they're being um, marketed and selected for, and there is genetic testing going on. You just have to remember that uh, you can only use those predictions with animals that are uh, are well characterized or or are related to those animals who the original testing was done on. So and and now most of the other breeds are are doing that type of testing. Um, one thing you have to keep in mind when you're talking about animals and people with animals, we can we can collect DNA on a large number of animals, and they're most of them are related to each other. So it's a lot easier to do genetic testings for different traits in people. They they do whatever they want. You can't tell um, Mr. Smith that he has to produce kids with um, Mrs. White, for example. But in cattle, you can <laughs> <laughs> you can set up those meetings to achieve a specific purpose. So, in in essence, it's uh, a lot easier to to look for uh, connections between genetics and traits. Uh, in livestock as opposed to people. People are, are they have, they, they do what they want, basically. And the cattle never complain about these forced matings? Uh, they're not exactly forced matings. <laughs> <laughs> you, you generally uh, put them together in a field and they take care of the rest. You maybe provide a bit of violin music, but they are fine. They're not forced to do anything. <laughs> well, you know, I, our talk about chimpanzees earlier has prompted me to think of a company called 24 and Me. Anyway, there's a, we have a, a questions from uh, two different uh, people, if I can just call them up here. Um, uh, and it looks like I can only get one at the moment. But, um, the, oh, no, I've got them both. So... They're very, very similar. One is from Massey Secondary School in Windsor, Ontario, and the other is from a student at St. Joan of Arc School in Calgary. Um, I'll read them both, but they're pretty much the same. Uh, Massey Secondary School wants to know, is it possible to mutate a gene in a living human at an adult age to cure or treat disease? Yeah, to cure or treat disease. A student from St. Joan of Arc says, are there any human genes that scientists have modified in living people. So really this question is what can we do gene therapy quote unquote in adult human beings? Yeah, so um, there's there's two broad approaches to well there's lots of approaches to gene therapy but I, I tend to think about them as, as this way. Um, uh, one is to replace a gene um, in the body and and that's been the current approach for most disorders could use cystic fibrosis as an example so cystic fibrosis is a disorder where we have a 
membrane protein, a membrane channel that isn't working in our lungs. Um, that creates a whole series of cascade events. We gum up our lungs. The kids who have this end up with recurrent infections. Um, so you're missing the CF gene. It doesn't create the CF protein that should be sitting in the lung uh, respiratory epithelium. And so there have been people who have, in clinical trials, created a virus that has the human uh, CF gene in it. We know viruses like to infect our lungs. That's why we constantly get colds. Um, so you take an adenovirus, you put the human gene in it. You can get that into the lungs because there's air going in and out. You breathe it in. And you can actually get that human CF gene to do what viruses do, which is to infect integrate their DNA and it brings along the human gene and it will produce CF protein um, which is amazing so yeah. it should cure kids um, and it does produce some protein that is going to start functioning the problem is, is that gene doesn't stay there very long so eventually the body says wait a minute you're not integrated into a chromosome you're kind of foreign DNA and I don't I'm not going to hang on to you. So you'd have to repetitively infect the kids right. and what happens with repetitive infection is we eventually develop immunity so that's been one strategy is to find a way of infecting the body with a virus that's carrying a human gene and some of those trials have occurred. There was a tragic death a number of years ago of a patient who was undergoing a gene therapy trial um, and, and that really put the brakes on the whole field, really yeah. rattled everyone. So it's come back a little bit. This, so there are more cautious trials. We actually have one uh, that we're participating in in Calgary where we're extracting bone as uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells from an individual by getting their blood and pulling those cells out we will replace the gene in those cells and we'll give them back to that person and so, that model will work okay so let me ask you a question about that in the virus thing the problem was as you said that the CF gene doesn't integrate into the chromosomes yeah. of those cells so it's kind of transient uh, how can you ensure but in the stem cell you're replacing it correct how can you Again, ensure that it's going to stay there so what we're doing in that scenario is we're actually creating a construct. Remember, DNA likes to, to cross over, right? So we can create a construct that's going to line up, sit on the native DNA, and when it crosses over, it's going to integrate that piece of it. Yes. The problem with that is you want to make sure it goes to the right place. You don't want it to integrate in the wrong place because it could integrate in the middle of an important gene, right? Or it could integrate in front of something that could turn on a tumor gene. So there's been a lot of question of do we integrate this in? It's not being integrated into the germline, so it wouldn't get passed on to the next generation. It only gets integrated into that cell that we're looking at. So this isn't changing the human race. It's changing the functional genes in that body. So that's the key, is to get those to stably and safely integrate. I think the second question is actually a really interesting one, because I suspect that person's asking a very, uh, very new question in science, is that we now have the ability to take a series of DNA sequence and the way I was describing it before we would just get it to integrate a new one but if you have a series of genetic letters and you want to change a C to a T the T is the one you need that produces the right codon sequence yep. to integrate a protein can you edit that one can you just change it and that technology has become available it's called gene editing or CRISPR technology being used heavily in research, I suspect it's hit bovine research, it's hit model systems research where you can now go in and create or fix or change a DNA sequence. Now that's a game changer if you can do that very safely, with safety being the question. Could you go in and instead of replacing a new CF gene, just go in and say, wait a minute, I don't like that amino acid, that, right, right, that, that sequence code, that's that in there. Sequence. I'm just going to go change it and CRISPR is highly specific to specific locations. So gene editing has not been done in humans, um, but there are definitely big research groups um, looking at can the technology safely repair a gene, which would, you know, from a humanity perspective, you know, we have millions of people in the world who live with highly, highly penetrant, devastating human genetic diseases. Millions. In fact, there's millions in Canada. So... It, we have, there, there are actually some questions related to this. Um, let me ask you one from Yasin, a grade 12 student. Since we know the basic units that make up DNA, just as you were saying, can we mix and match the pieces like Lego, creating something unique each time? Or, and this is the best part of the question, is it a bit more complicated than that? Carolyn? 
Yeah, that's a fun one because I used to play a lot with Lego when I was a kid. <laughs> we all did. <laughs> so, so it is actually really nice to think about DNA as Lego because there are a lot of little building blocks and and by themselves they don't really make up much, but put them together you can make some pretty remarkable things. Um, I think to answer that question, we do start to know a lot more about individual genes and how they function, but there's a lot more to DNA than just genes. There's the, the sequence that's around the genes that we're starting to learn a bit more about, but there's also a lot of other um, uh, intergenetic sequence that we don't know um, what its function is. We do know that it's important. Um, probably about 20 years ago, maybe we didn't think it was that important, but as we learn more and more about the genome, we realize that this also really makes up who we are. So, so right now it's not really possible really just to split DNA up and, and uh, put it back together in a reasonable manner and, and make something out of it, maybe for very small genomes like um, bacterial genomes or viruses, the, the same similar to what Francois was mentioning about earlier as reconstructing a virus genome to insert a gene. But to, to make a complex living organism, it would be like um, you're, you, you get a set of Legos and uh, you show someone a picture of a very complex like spaceship on on the front cover but you don't give them the instructions and you tell them to try and make it exactly like the picture that's kind of like how we are today we we can see the blocks we can see the the picture of the organism and we know that some blocks go in certain places but without the map um, the instructions to make that complex spaceship, we can't put it back together in, in a reasonable manner. Francois, you good with yeah, that? Yeah, that's great. I mean, the, it, it, highly complex, no doubt. A, a great answer. And I, the, there was a recent um, news clip that, that hit uh, kind of uh, social media a little bit and sort of the science media that someone had created two new building life uh, um, uh, blocks and and I was like what are they talking about and you know we have ACGT right we have the four nucleotides that builds up our DNA and what this group managed to do is create two new ones and get them to be able to play nice with the other one so you could in, and then you have a new instead of playing with the Lego block I guess four colors you've now got six and does that expand our ability maybe not in humans but in artificial scenarios where you might want to produce a unique protein that could be a therapy could we start engineering well, your stuff that's I mean, sort of, honestly that sounds like it just multiplies the problems and challenges <laughs> to me we can really do it with four. Yeah. you know i i think you know these are really good questions and i, I think what the, one of the things they get at is you know 10 12 years ago the human genome project was finished and I think a lot of people were misled into thinking, well, okay, now we got it. So now it's just a question of applying the tools that we have and everything's figured out. And then you look at the situation today, and as Carolyn was suggesting, there are, there are so many things going on to determine how your DNA is expressed. And many of them we don't even know yet. So, you know, it's kind of, it's a bit like physics, right? You keep going smaller and smaller scales and you keep finding new things. The, the Human Genome Project, uh, when it was completed, was one of the largest scientific studies ever undertaken by humans yep. in a collaborative way. There's actually a larger one that many people haven't heard of called the ENCODE Project. ENCODE uh, was uh, a multinational, um, extremely well-funded project. The goal of ENCODE um, was to start understanding the regulatory elements of the human genome. So 3% of our 3 billion letters as humans is coding. It's genes directly with a purpose to produce a protein. Yeah. Um, the sense from ENCODE is that we actually have you know, tens of millions of regulatory sequences all that other stuff that we used to call junk DNA. 
is all structured in certain ways. It's highly conserved. It's functional elements. So it, we're not done in understanding how this complex three billion letter set of, of genetic code in the end functions to produce what is really an incredible enterprise. Right? So, it sounds a bit so, to me like, um, like your phone. Right, your the the stuff that you can do with your phone is pretty obvious. You know how to do it, but you don't ever really think of what's behind that. What's going on in the phone that allows you to send text messages? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as we sit here, we have thousands and thousands in each of our cells of transcription factors turning on and off, being regulated, genes being silenced, turned on, proteins being silenced, turned on all the time. I mean, it's a remarkable system. Okay, so, let's, uh, yeah, no, no, we've got uh, so many questions, I don't really, let, you mentioned race before, I think you did, in, in passing, and Radhika, a grade 12 student, wants to know, is race determined by a gene? And I guess what, the first thing we should say is that a lot of scientists aren't even comfortable with the concept of race. Yeah. Ra race means a lot of different things, but you can you can say, of, of course, like uh, was mentioned earlier, you know, genes do determine your color of your hair, the color of your skin, um, how tall you are. You know, it, it does determine different physical aspects about yourself. That that that's not necessarily tied to to race. I guess race is, I guess I consider race a, a different uh, definition than really how you look. Yeah, a social definition, not a scientific definition. Yeah, yeah I mean this is, uh, we, could, we could have spent our hour and a half on this one and many very thoughtful uh, sociologists, uh, anthropologists, scientists um, have, have done so and many more to try and sort this one out. I mean, I think for many of us in science, you know, race is really a cultural concept and it's probably best a self-identified concept. So people would understand, you know, if you ask them where they're from, they may give a, a race uh, question, you know, I'm black, I'm white, I'm Chinese. Um, but those are really, you know, cultural constructs around, I have a shared language, I have a shared uh, physical trait sometimes um, with that race and I identify with it and highly charged word in many ways so I think from a genetics perspective it, there's been an enormous amount of work and, and for the classes out there and teachers who want a great source of this type of information I, I can't resist the plug for the National Geographic Genographic Project and what the G National Geographic did is they went out uh, with an amazing group of scientists that they funded and across the world obtained DNA samples and typed them for variants, genetic markers, across the world. And the question they're often asking is, you know, what is your maternal, your grandmother's language to try and get a sense of, mm -hmm. of ethnicity or at least ancestry, you know, where did your family originate from? And uh, many groups have done this in the world, um, but they have a very nice website and it's very well described of sort of now understanding what genetic variants have arisen at what stage of hmm. migration of the human population from Africa to Eurasia and then uh, the Dispera uh, out across to North America, Central America. So you can, and they have a test, now that's a fun test. They have a, same like the other companies, but they have a test that you can send in your DNA and they will give you information on your lineage. And so that's genetic lineage. That's I want to do sense. that. It's a fascinating. Although I'm probably boringly English going back. Oh, no, no you're not. <laughs> no, it is. Because we all have tiebacks to much older parts of our genome, right? So it, 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 no one is pure anything. And that's the other thing with race. You could take anyone who says I'm black, and they're not, they're yeah, not yeah, black, yeah. right? It, it, there's an admixture of a complex history of human migration and interaction that is held in our DNA. So that's a fun test. And what's, and what's that website called again? Uh, I would have to look it up. Maybe we'll post it. Genographic. G -E -N -O okay. Genographic. Um, okay. And so, it, 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 so that's physical anthropology in a sense as opposed to social anthropology, right? But physical anthropology which is now looking at not only physical traits but human physiology and human DNA to help us understand our anthropology, our ancestry of how our population migrated and changed. It's an absolutely wonderful site. That they would be such a cool thing for a class to do. 
brilliant. Brilliant. Everybody, you yeah. know everybody as your friends, and then you see where, what other parts of the world have, and how shared they, they come are. from. You know, yeah. I think if you want to start breaking down social barriers, which, anyways, now we're we're digressing. So, uh, genetic ancestry for sure. Does genes influence our physical traits for sure? But um, we're we're a complex mixture, and uh, the National Geographic can do it better, and I can. Good. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Well, no, let's take them one at a time. Moen, a grade 12 student from Lester B. Pearson Collegiate, wants to know, can a traumatic memory be inherited from parents or grandparents? How, do, how does, so that's part one. There, part two, how does psychological trauma affect the mechanisms of inheritance? That's a really interesting question. Do you mind, uh, Rachel? I'm just going to dive into this one and, and okay. add your thoughts, Rachel. So. Ten years ago, I, I know what my answer would have been, what, to this would have been. It would have been absolutely not. I just don't understand how those, those things could influence. Like a DNA. traumatic event yeah. have an influence, influence on your genes. Yeah. Right. We just didn't understand, maybe 15 years ago. But So this gives us a chance to talk about a genetic mechanism called epigenetics. Um, so we've talked about DNA being a coded sequence that typically produces a protein and is highly regulated. And we've talked about genetic variants, a mutation, that changes a protein or something, yeah. right? But what we've understood actually epigenetically is the concept that you can change how that gene is expressed, not just by changing the sequence, the mutation, but by putting a mark on it. And that mark is an epigenetic mark. It's typically methylation or the way DNA is. So coiled. it is some kind of molecule that it gets Correct. attached or whatever. But it's not changing the sequence. Right. And it's erasable, mm -hmm. right? So you can mark it or you can unmark it. And so in mice, if you look at mice that are happily bred with their mother licking and taking care of them, or mice that are traumatized as young mice, you will get different epigenetic marks in front of key genes that regulate the hypothalamic pituitary axis. axis. And that axis is crucial for under helping us regulate stress response, emotional response, et cetera, et cetera. So life experience biologically now has a link to genes, gene expression, and mechanism through epigenetics. So does this operate in humans? Maybe. And so I'm going to, can I go on for a sec? Yeah, please do. So there's a hypothesis out there called the Barker hypothesis. And um, I don't know if it's called that in the bovine literature, but for us it was a recognition that birth weight actually influenced your long-term health smaller babies had a higher risk of long-term heart disease than big, bigger babies. And the guy who published this was disparaged in the literature for years, but he was right. What happens is that your in access to nutrition prenatally changes your epigenetic regulation of key regulatory genes that end up helping you survive as a baby but have a long-term influence. So that's the classic example in humans of epigenetics. So um, the first part of the question is, can a traumatic memory influence or traumatic experiences influence us? Sure they do. Um, we know that. We know that early life experiences can influence us. But they're not the be all and end all. They don't you know, stamp us for life. But they can influence us. Is there a mechanism for that? Maybe there is, and it could be epigenetics. Historically, we would have said that that can't get transmitted to the next generation, that the next generation we yeah. wipe all the epigenetic marks, we just flatten it all out, and we start over. Well, the plant world, or animal world, tells us a whole bunch of this. So if you're a little Daphnia, and you're one of these little multi water flea kind of thing, yeah. if you're a Daphnia and you've been stressed, you grow a helmet. I love it, right? I don't know if you're supposed to protect yourself from being <laughs> whacked, but you grow a helmet. That's actually an epigenetic mark, right? And then, well, actually, I'm not sure it's epigenetic, but that gets transmitted to the next generation, and so, it disappears. Because it was so, it was thought for a very long time that things that happen to you in yeah. this life yeah. could not be transmitted yeah. to your children genetically, yeah. and now so there's it's possible. It's possible. So it's possible. I mean, that's a that overturns everything, and old Lysenko will be yeah. jumping up and down in his yeah. grave. So we don't know. Um, uh, any um, yeah, is there epigenetic any? work in the in the bovine world? Yeah, um, there there's not a lot, but it there's a there's a bit of it going on. Um, basically, we do follow the 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 work that's been done in humans quite a bit. So there are some nutritional trials of looking at 
you know, different diets being fed either um, right before an animal gets pregnant or, or during pregnancy to see if there's any effects on the offspring. But <clears throat> I did want to go back to the question, um, the one about uh, can a traumatic memory be inherited pr from the parents? Yeah. Like, just to just to clarify one one bit that Francois mentioned that you know the the tra traumatic memory may not be transferred, but the mark on the DNA might be. So so just to clarify, and and that mark. Yeah may have some consequences. It, it could be positive, it could be negative. You, you don't know, but, but we, we can see that there is maybe a mark being transferred. We have to figure out how, why, it, why it's transferred and what it really means for the, the children of those parents. And you know, it, it, this is a point where uh, genetics starts to encompass social knowledge. So for instance, it's pretty clear that very young kids who endure uh, not just normal stress, we all go through normal stress of one kind or another, but what some people call toxic stress, uh, are then more prone to things like uh, addiction and delinquency when they're in their teens or, or early 20s. And I don't think the mechanism has exactly been worked out, but it wouldn't be surprising if this toxic stress when a kid is three or four uh, causes markers to be added to their DNA, which then influence how prone they are to these these other things. So, it, you know, I'm not saying that is the case, but uh, it could yeah. well be. So, it's, it's, go it's ahead, not a bad, It's also it's not a bad thing. It's this is one of the mechanisms that have been proposed to help animals and all living things survive short-term stress. Yeah. So so it's a it's a way we we've we've our genetics are adaptable within one generation. So so we kind of need this to to survive. I'm going to throw out a question here. Uh, it came in anonymously and we may or may not have the answer to this one. Some parasites can steal their host's genomes, making the host dependent on the parasite. Um, so the question is, could this mechanism, parasitic infection somehow altering the genome, could that be used constructively? So that's a pretty speculative question, but uh, I'm throwing it out to the two of you because I don't know the answer. This must be in in uh, insects and bacteria or something like that. Could be. I know that there are parasites that induce changes in behavior in the yeah. host, right? Yeah. So that there are uh, ants that get infected and, and have a tendency then to climb up to the top of a blade of grass where they're more easily taken by another animal. But I don't know that those are actual. I don't know if that works on the genome or not. And besides, yeah, I, just kind of didn't I, 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 don't, I haven't heard of anything that actually internalizes the host genome into the, into the parasite. Have you guys? No, ancestrally, the only thing I'm coming up with, I, that's a great question. I, yeah, know, yeah, maybe, we'll, cool question. maybe we'll see someone uh, uh, type in a response or something cool. So, um, but, you know, our mitochondria, uh, our, so our powerhouses, right, the organelle that, that um, is actually not being shaped, it's a, it's a very complex organelle, it probably was a symbiotic relationship with some sort yeah. of ancestral bacteria or, and, you know, so they are now definitely were reliant on bacteria ancestral DNA or at least a mechanism to create energy and but you know that that's a very complex question. I yeah. suspect there's there's something more more imminent in this whole question than someone well, very I, smart out there is asking a good one. Yeah, well, let's hope maybe yeah. some uh, yeah. answer will come in. And uh, sure. you know, we don't have a huge amount of time left, and I, I want to just circle back to GMOs because although we mentioned them, I don't think the question was quite as short and crisp as this one from a student at St. Joan of Arc School who asks. Are GMO foods safe for people to eat? So I think we have to put a, yeah. our answer out there for that. 
Okay. I guess uh, from my point of view, the the GMO foods that that do make it to the marketplace or are in approved for human consumption, they've been tested quite rigorously, and uh, they, from from all research, has shown that they are safe to to eat. Um, they've gone through. Uh, a lot of testing before they can make it to market. Um, uh, when you make a, a GMO organism that might be um, uh, end up in the human food chain, there's a lot of tests that that you need to perform to make sure the the food is new food is safe to eat or the GM, the the plant is safe to eat. But also that uh, the plant can um, is safe to grow in the environment, and and the genes that have been or or modified in the plant, um, they they will be contained within the plant and and not uh, uh, get released. Um, so so the foods that are on the market are, are safe to to eat by um, through, well, from what all the research has shown, maybe you guys can answer it better. <laughs> no, no, Carolyn, I think that's a great, uh, so absolutely. I think the part of the, the fear around GMOs has been, you know, these are, are now genetically modified foods, and, and if there's a gene in there uh, that we put into that's not typically in the food we're eating, could it get into our bodies and integrate or change us? And I heard somewhere that we're exposed about a gram of DNA, foreign DNA every day in the food we eat, and you know we think it's all clean, but there's bacterial DNA, there's DNA, there's in insect food, parts. There's I know that all kinds of stuff. So we're actually we have a really robust mechanism to protect ourselves from DNA. Our stomach is a horrid environment; it's incredibly acidic. Um, it will destroy any DNA molecule that goes in that way. The bugs that are able to create GI infections, you know, gastroenteritis and all these, they have developed ways of escaping the stomach and all our defense mechanisms to actually create an infection lower down in the gut. But native DNA or DNA that's in a cell would immediately get completely destroyed by us, and we need that source probably for the building blocks. So. Um, it, the exposure level is extremely high to GMOs and there's been no uh, no documented ill effects and it's probably one of the most highly regulated and highly scrutinized field right now so currently probably felt to be safe but uh, I'm not a GMO expert. All of this is true but it, it also is true that the controversy is not going to go away no. anytime soon because I think people that are uh, people that fear the advent of GMOs are taking an, uh, maybe an extreme version of what some people call the precautionary principle that, uh, you know, can we actually predict exactly what the impact will be? Well, you know, there's always, there's always uncertainty. And so you can have a situation where we have now where all the science, as far as uh, I know, and as Carolyn suggested, the science is solidly saying GMOs are safe, but then the other part of the equation is people, and they don't always put... 100% of their faith in science. Just an update on the parasites that uh, change their host genomes. Uh, I can't give you chapter and verse, but I can name a parasitic plant in Malaysia called Raffelsia cantlii, which apparently participates in this in this mechanism, named after uh, probably the Raffles uh, Hotel in Singapore. There's a little absolutely useless tidbit of information. Uh, does, it, does it say what uh, what it does? Um, I'm sorry, I haven't caught up to that part of it yet. Uh, but I have given no, you, uh, a, you know, a species name, so uh, we can go from there. A um, uh, student from St. Joan of Arc School in Calgary asks, is Alzheimer's disease hereditary? Um, I've been reading a little bit about this. Maybe I'll do a really quick answer. And that is, you've got to distinguish between what's called early onset uh, familial, that is within the family Alzheimer's, that where the disease shows up mostly when people are in their 50s. And there are three genes that are known to be associated with that. And they actually, if you get the gene, your chances are very high that you will get Alzheimer's. So that's, that's those are genes, three of them only, and they represent less 
less than 1% of all Alzheimer's, but nonetheless, they kind of dictate that you will get the disease. But the vast majority of Alzheimer's is what's called late onset, happens between ages of, say, 65 and on up. Um, there is one gene, I should also say many new genes are being explored, but to date, one gene is really known to be associated with that. It doesn't dictate that you'll get it, it just alters your risk. And in fact, even if you get the two bad versions of this bad gene, um, you really only have about a 50-50 chance of getting Alzheimer's. So my general message, and you know, please correct me if you think I'm overdoing it, is that you know, if your grandmother had Alzheimer's uh, and she got it when she was 75, I really don't think that's a cause for concern because there are many other things that affect your risk. That's just one of them. And it's exactly what we tell our current physicians. So do you want a job? <laughs> no, that's, that's exactly it. Complex yeah. traits. Still evolving. I mean, people are hunting for the rest of that yeah. heritability and the late onset, but that's a very complex disease. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's, the hereditary part of it is much less frightening than I feel it should yeah, be. And absolutely. that's what I tell people. Uh, we talked about Down syndrome earlier. Uh, the, those people that have three copies of chromosome 21. Here's a really interesting question. Nancy, on behalf of her grade 11 class, wants to know, if a Down syndrome parent has a child with a healthy parent, uh, healthy being just two copies of chromosome 21, what are the chances of producing a Down syndrome baby? So this is actually um, a very, very common question for parents who have a child with Down syndrome um, and for the adults who have Down syndrome. So it sends us back to our biology again, right? So what's going to happen at meiosis is we're going to pair up our chromosomes and then we're going to send them in different directions so that you get a haploid set, right? So what happens when you have a third chromosome in is it does have a, doesn't have a pairing partner. And male spermatogenesis does not tolerate that at all. So men with Down syndrome are infertile. Hmm. They just can't get through that meiotic step of pairing up hmm. their chromosomes and separating them out. So all males with Down syndrome never been recorded to have a child. They're all infertile. Now, female oogenesis, and this is true of all genetic dis, uh, chromosome disorders, in many ways, is a little bit more tolerant. So in most females with Down syndrome are also infertile and will have difficulty with that pairing process because of the extra chromosome. But some can produce eggs, and, and if they do, then we know what the answer is going to be, right? Because they're going to pair these two up, and one's going to go in this direction, one's going to go in that direction. So you can produce a an egg that would have 121 at fertilization, bring another 21, you're okay. So you can't have a normal child. But where's that extra chromosome going to go? It's random. If it goes that way, you get two in that egg, one in this egg. But if it goes this way, this has got one, this one's now got two. At fertilization, you're going to bring another one up from the to, sperm, and then it's up to you three. Got three. So the risk is about 50 50 of having a child with Down syndrome. A little bit lower, they tend to see the normal process happen, but there is a risk that, that a female who is fertile with Down syndrome, about 50-50 would have a child with Down syndrome. And it's not possible, is it, to have a sort of partial Down syndrome situation? Um, so there is. So when we look at Down syndrome, we'd say about 95% have three chromosomes, trisomy 21. Yeah. And in the rest of the 5%, there's a small number who are mosaic. A mosaic is at conception may have had three chromosome 21s, but shortly after those in those first divisions lost one. Wow. So now you have so cells in the body that have trisomy three. 21 and some cells that have two dies over. So that would be a mosaic downs. And they're typically going to be milder. They can range right up to Down syndrome or they can be very mild. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a mosaic downs and then we have translocation downs. And I guess we Five. probably have mosaics of many different chromosomes. We have mosaics of every genetic disorder. You are a mosaic for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. You have to be. Somewhere in your body, you've divided have your cells, cells that, that have been divided. That had I had all times. of them, I would be exactly. have muscular dystrophy. But it doesn't matter if you have a mutation for muscular dystrophy in your finger. It's not wow. early enough to, right? So we are mosaics for everything. I'll tell you this, cancer is probably mosaic for a gene mutation. That's where it arises. As our cells are devising, dividing, we suddenly get a mutation. Right? Yeah. 
And that mutation is going to destabilize that cell. Another mutation occurs, another mutation, and boom. So we get cancer when we're older. Our cells have been dividing longer. We get cancers in cells that divide a lot. Lining of our bowel, breast tissue, Right, blood right, cells right. Right? Yeah. They've been dividing a lot. Um, is there an environmental influence? Hey, hey Carolyn, could I, could I just uh, bust in and ask you a quick question about, we've talked a lot about uh, genetic uh, disabilities or diseases in humans. What about in cattle? Yeah, we we uh, if we if we have a disease or condition that uh, shows a clear mode of inheritance, so that we can follow it from from parents to offspring, then we we can use uh, genomics and and specialized matings to try and zero in on that gene that's causing that uh, partic particular condition. So some some diseases, for example, there's a white heifer disease in, in cattle. We know the gene that uh, causes that mutation, and and we don't um, we don't knock it out or anything. But but we breed animals together that we know will produce healthy healthy offspring, depending on the the genotype at that gene that causes the disease. So, so simple things um, that we can follow the pattern of inheritance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can develop genetic tests for them and then we uh, basically select animals and, and mate them together that we know they have little or, or a very or no chance to produce that condition. Um. I want to leave a little bit of time at the end for both of you just to send a, a message to everyone watching as to what you think has been important about this event and what's important about genomics. But there's one more question uh, that I'd like to tackle, which is in, really intriguing. A student from St. Joan of Arc School in, in Calgary wants to know, is it possible for a trait to completely leave the gene pool? So, and I'm assuming that means there was once a gene among humans that now is no longer there. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. It, it depends what time scale we're talking about. We're talking very, very large time scale, you know, thousands of years type thing. Absolutely, genes have come and gone, and, and, and some because they were detrimental to us, some because they had no impact. On a shorter time scale, there are mutations that definitely will suddenly disappear. Um, because they weren't passed on. So just by random chance, if you're in a population that got very tight, you'll disappear. Um, but new mutations occur all the time. You know, there's seven, you know, six, five, six billion of us in the, in the world. Every time a child is produced, we have created new mutations. We are unable to copy that amount of DNA without making new changes. So we are probably reintroducing these genetic changes as well. So genetic disorders, you know, are constantly being reintroduced, even though they may have stopped in a particular family, they're going to show up in another family. And there, there's also this uh, mechanism whereby when certain diseases were prevalent in the world, um, like the Black Death, yeah. certain genes would have been protective for people and those people would have survived and yeah. those genes would have become more common. But nowadays, when there's virtually no Black Death, uh, those genes might actually not be helpful, and so they, and they tend to yeah. disappear again. Yeah. This has been a fantastic discussion, and uh, I just want to get a couple of uh, thoughts from both our experts before we close it off. So, uh, Carolyn, um, you've been with us now for an hour and a half listening to these fantastic questions and answers. Uh, what would be a final message from you? Um, I guess, like from what I've heard from the students, you're all really very curious about genetics and, and DNA. And I, I think that if you're interested in the field, uh, pay attention to what's coming up uh, and, and do your own research. There's a lot of new and exciting things. And, and like we, we found a lot about genetics and DNA and how it's work how it works but there's a lot more that that's there to be discovered so so if you're really interested in the field like keep keep looking into things and and ask questions because there's a lot of really interesting research going on and it'll be going on for quite a while so so and kudos to you guys for asking such great questions as well 
Yeah, I don't think you need to repeat the thing. And the research is going to be going on for a long time. Yeah, I, I think brilliant questions. It was it was a lot of fun to read through them and and think hard about them, which I think both both of us had to do. I think the what we didn't talk about in the, is the power of, of genomic technology right now. So we can read, you know, 30 million letters of genetic code, all human, 20,000 human disease, human genes, all of our genes, in you know three to four hours of time on a sequencing instrument these days, and that gives us an unprecedented ability to start thinking about how to use that information. Uh, to improve human health, to understand the human condition, um, but also challenges us, I think, for people who are more in the sort of social sciences side to think of how we're going to use these technologies as a society. Um, and the questions covered everything from really hardcore yeah, yeah. science to sort of the social implications of science, which I, I think is absolutely brilliant. So uh, have enjoyed it. Keep uh, online asking questions if you have more of them. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I, I would just make uh, one really important point to everybody watching, and the, you know, the fact is um, that what DNA, like what we've been able to do for the last hour and a half, is actually put you di directly in touch with people who are researching in the field. That's not a, uh, you don't get that opportunity very often. And I would also, uh, although it's pretty obvious, that all your questions were treated with great interest and respect and a lot of thought, which you know, again, is, a, I think, a great thing, and uh, kudos to our, our two experts. And, you know, DNA Day makes this possible, so we help, we hope that it'll continue, or that this day will continue to inspire you and maintain your interest in science, technology, and math. And as um, both uh, of our guests, Caroline and Francois, have said, there's a lot of, lot of genomics research going on in uh, Canadian labs right now, looking at the genetics of autism, cancer genetics that Francois uh, mentioned briefly, stem cell therapies and how they interact with genomics, and of course uh, in agriculture, Carolyn's field. Um, but you know, I'm I'm not a scientist. I'm actually a science communicator, and I've all I always feel that it's not just the science that's important. It's getting it out there to people who aren't scientists, so we can have a really full discussion of all the science and what it means for us in the future. So today's discussion was made possible by Let's Talk Science and Genome Alberta, and both of them uh, offer other opportunities for you to explore the world of science, tech, and innovation, and connect with science communities. And again, support for DNA Day today. We sh I should have worn my DNA tie. I actually have a DNA tie but I don't really wear ties that much. Support for DNA Day also came from Genome Canada, Genome Atlantic, Genome BC, the Ontario Genomics Institute, Genome Prairie, and Cybera. Now, if you want to continue your DNA discussion, you can join one of the text-based chats. They're going to start about half an hour from now. So thanks again for joining us for DNA Day's uh, Google Chat. Thanks, Carolyn in Edmonton. Thank you, Francois, here in Calgary. And we hope that all of you will join us again next April 2016. Bye-bye.